Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to session two, track four of the National Coastal and Estuarine Summit. The title of this session is Collaborative Programs to Enhance the Resilience of Communities and Ecosystems to Climate Change. My name is Nathan Vinatero. I'm the Assistant Director of the Coastal Institute at the University of Rhode Island, and I will be moderating this afternoon's session. Uh, we've got a great lineup of speakers who are going to talk about programs here in New England that assist local communities in addressing risks from sea level rise, storm surge flooding, coastal erosion, and other climate change impacts. In fact, our speaker panel includes individuals from each of New England's coastal states. So through this sequence of talks, we'll actually work our way up the coast. We're going to hear first from Juliana Barrett at Connecticut Sea Grant. Juliana will present on the University of Connecticut's Climate Core Program, which partners undergraduate students with local communities to help them assess risk and adapt to climate change. Next up is Peter August from the University of Rhode Island, and Pete will be talking about the Coastal Institute's Climate Response Demonstration Site Initiative. Uh, these are sites across the state that were selected in order to represent different shoreline types that are common here in Rhode Island in order to monitor different adaptation practices. Patricia Bowie from Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management will present on CCM's Coastal Resilience Grant Program. This program provides funding and technical support to communities and nonprofits in Massachusetts for a range of coastal resilience projects. Kirsten Howard from New Hampshire's Department of Environmental Services Coastal Program will discuss work being done by that office to assist the town of Hampton, New Hampshire, as they deal with increased flooding from sea level rise. And our last speaker will be Peter Slavinsky, who's with the Maine Geological Survey. Pete will present some case studies from Maine where they're focused on developing adaptation measures that can be transferred across municipalities. And although they're not on the speaking docket th this afternoon, I wanted to acknowledge two colleagues from URI that have been helping to coordinate the session and to organize talks. Uh, Teresa Crean is from the Coastal Resources Center and Rhode Island Sea Grant, and Charlie Roman is an Associate Director at the URI Coastal Institute. So thanks to you both. A few housekeeping details. Um, as a reminder, these presentations have been pre-recorded, so you're going to be viewing all five talks in sequence over the next 60 minutes. I will then moderate a live Q&A session, um, which will last approximately 15 minutes. There should be an option to submit written questions through this platform, so please take advantage of that feature and I can compile the questions uh, for the Q&A at the end of the session. And we'll be wrapping up this afternoon at 3.45 p.m. Eastern. So thanks again for joining us. I'm really looking forward to the next hour of talks. Uh, my contact information is on this slide in case you'd like to be in touch after the session concludes. I can also relay any late questions to our speakers if needed. Um, so thanks and enjoy the presentations. This is Peter August and I'll be delivering this presentation on behalf of a number of colleagues who have worked very hard to make the Coastal Institute demonstration site project happen. I'll be introducing them uh, momentarily. But let me give a, a quick shout out to two people who have developed the concept of the demonstration site project and who work tirelessly behind the scenes to make that happen. That's Judith Swift, the director of the URI Coastal Institute, and Amber Neville, who's our digital media communications specialist. Um, without the work of these two people, I would have nothing to say today. They've been uh, key members. Um, climate change impacts are here and now in Rhode Island. Um, we're already seeing uh, the, the effects of climate change uh, here in the ocean state. The purpose of the demonstration site project is to identify communities and areas where innovative, innovative solutions are being developed in collaborative ways to deal with projected sea level rise impacts, to identify gaps in our knowledge, to fill those gaps, and to get word out of best management practices to deal with this. We have three demonstration sites in Rhode Island. Our natural areas, the, the Napa Tree Point Conservation Area, um, off the coast of Westerly. Uh, you'll be hearing a lot about this in a moment. Our mixed use areas in Barrington and Warren in the northern part of Narragansett Bay, heavily developed residential and commercial, some natural areas mixed in too. And both of these communities are very low elevation. The third is our working waterfront in Providence, our urban area site, and nearby Roger Williams Park. And here's a quick map of our, um, the location of our three demonstration sites. Let me start with the Napa Tree Point Conservation Area. This is truly a collaborative project. 
Napa Tree is managed by the Watch Hill Conservancy, which owns a conservation easement over the property, which is owned by the Watch Hill Fire District. Um, faculty and students from the University of Rhode Island and Eastern Connecticut State University are heavily involved in um, monitoring and management programs uh, on Napa Tree. So it, it's really taken a large team to um, deal with the management issues that we have. A little bit of geography. Napa Tree is a pristine barrier spit system, 30, 34 hectares, um, an area almost two kilometers long, very low elevation. The land is owned by the fire district, managed by the conservancy, and heavily used in the summertime. We can get 900 people on our beach on a busy summer day, 400 people, 400 boats at anchor along our northern shore. It's a big challenge for us is keeping Napa Tree from being loved to death. Look on the right side of this slide. This is Napa Tree now. It's a Audubon Society globally important bird area. It's part of the John Chafee U.S. Fish and Wildlife System Coast and Barrier Reserve System. It's a pristine barrier spit, arguably one of the most uh, pristine spits um, uh, this side of, of uh, Cape Cod. It's incredibly important for migratory birds, both, both in the spring and the fall. It's a biodiversity hotspot. It hasn't always been like this. Um, prior to 1938, there were 39 homes lining the spine of Napa Tree. Uh, in these two older pictures on the left, you can see those homes in the top one. The arrow points to a short jetty going out into the ocean. Hurricane of 38 wiped Napa Tree clean. Every one of the structures on Napa Tree uh, washed into Little Narragansett Bay. The slate was wiped clean. The Watch Hill Fire District purchased the property so it could be set aside as a nature reserve. Napa Tree is storm driven. It's a very resilient system as we just discovered on the last, last slide. 80 years after the Hurricane of 38, it's, it's a biodiversity hotspot. It's always changing. It's a very dynamic system and it's heavily used and appreciated by the community. Our management goals, let nature have its way. Make sure that natural ecosystem processes can occur. We have a large number of rare and endangered species that use Napa tree. We need to protect those. And it's important to us that this be a public resource and um, as much as we can, we educate the public as to the value that Napa tree brings. We know that one of the climate change impacts that we can expect are more, uh, more intense, frequent um, storms. Uh, hold that thought. Prior to Superstorm Sandy, we had 64 trails crossing Napa Tree. Visitors going from bay to ocean would walk willy-nilly through the dunes. These trails encompass almost two and a half miles. Um, during Superstorm Sandy, we had eight breaches of Napa Tree, creating washover fans at each one of these eight sites. Each one of these sites was on a, a crossover trail. Since then, we've reduced the number of approved trails down to eight. In the process, we've reclaimed almost an acre and a half of dune system, um, and we get 100% compliance of, of people walking from Bayside to, to the ocean side. The, um, the washover fans that were so conspicuous after Superstorm Sandy were invisible the following spring and summer because the root and rhizomes underneath those washovers, uh, washover plumes um, push their sprouts up and the vegetation thrive. So we've done a lot of plant restoration on our closed social trails using species that bring value to pollinators and migrants and that develop dense root and rhizome mats. Uh, hopefully helping make uh, Napa Tree a little bit more resilient to future storms where we get washover fans. Uh, Napa Tree is very dynamic. Dr. Oakley at Eastern Connecticut State University monitors dune height every quarter with an RTK GPS. And this way we're able to track the deposition and accretion of sand over time. Brian has found that it's taken five years to fully recover from the uh, dune erosion that, her, that Superstorm Sandy caused. Since 1939, Napa Tree has migrated one full um, width north into Little Narragansett Bay. 
The significance of this issue for us is historically we've used dune fencing to manage the flow of people. Dune fencing traps sand. Well, we now know that we, we want sand to flow where sand wants to flow um, to accommodate uh, dune dynamics. And so now we use split rail fencing, which is aesthetically beautiful. Uh, people understand that you don't go on the other side of the split rail fencing and sand can, can move through it. So another example of management to allow naturally occurring ecosystem processes. All of this happens while we monitor for change and educate our visitors and youth to the importance of these systems and best coastal stewardship practices. Let me flip, um, uh, change gears and let's talk about the mixed use areas, Barrington and Warren. Again, we have a big team working on this, Charlie Roman, Judah Swift, Amber Neville, Nate Venetero, and Teresa Crean from URI, and leadership from both the town of Warren and the town of Barrington. These are very densely developed low-lying areas, and we have determined that they're extremely vulnerable to sea level rise and storm events. A full 44% of all the residential and commercial structures in town would be inundated with a modest 25-year storm of five feet of sea level rise. Very vulnerable. Um, the issues aren't coming up in the future, they're here now. Nuisance tides are an ongoing issue. Our salt marshes aren't keeping up with uh, sea level rise in the town of Warren. Warren has already had to spend $20 million to fortify their wastewater treatment uh, system to accommodate three feet of sea level rise. Step one of the um, work happening here was to understand the nature of the problem. Get our arms around the tools available to map um, and assess risk. Present this information to the town leadership, present this information to, to the town residents, and share this information with the community at large. Then came the hard part, how do we deal with it? And so this has been a, a long series of, of, um, of meetings and workshops to, um, with community leadership and the public to figure out what the, the best resolutions might be to the sea level rise and surge threats that we see coming down the pipe. One vulnerability that became instantly clear was the vulnerability of our transportation system to big storms. This is a tough issue to crack. There are no cheap solutions. There's no simple solutions, and the group is working on it right now. A real asset to our work in uh, Barrington and Warren have been some student projects from UPenn and URI who brought a lot of creative, innovative thinking into the mix on how these communities might deal with sea level rise and storm surge. The last area that I'll briefly mention, there's just not enough time to go into, is the work that Austin Becker and Art Gold are doing in the Working Waterfront Port of Providence, which is a major regional node for the delivery of heating fuel and gasoline. And Roger Williams Park, a short distance away from, from the Port of Providence, which is the primary exposure to nature that a lot of underprivileged, underserved inner city resident gets. And Roger Williams Park has issues with stormwater runoff and water quality. And so Austin and, and Art are doing some terrific work there. One of the fundamental goals of our project was to work collaboratively. collaboratively. The issues are too big for any one group uh, to take on. And at Napa Tree, and our mixed use site, we've been very successful in bringing together a wonderful group of partners to deal with these. So thank you for giving me your time. I look forward to uh, answering any questions you might have in the question answer period. Uh, we'll have members of our team uh, signed on. So uh, I hope you jot down a couple of questions and we'll look forward to hearing from you. Okay, that concludes my presentation. Hi, my name is Juliana Barrett. I work on coastal habitat management and restoration with the Connecticut Seagrat College Program, as well as climate adaptation, where I work with municipalities and other groups such as land trusts. Today, I'm going to be talking about a new program at the University of Connecticut called the Climate Corps. This program was developed with my colleagues Bruce Hyde and Chet Arnold. So Bruce Hyde and I have worked with communities throughout Connecticut for quite a few years. And through meetings, listservs, interviews, uh, workshops, um, we have developed a priority list of climate adaptation issues for the state. Flooding is one of the highest priorities, whether it's along the coast or inland, along riverine systems. 
And you can see there's quite a few other issues that have risen to the top. So we've developed something called the Climate Adaptation Academy, where we hold workshops, meetings, uh, design charrettes to try to, to get at and provide information and tools for these priority issues. So here you can see a, a list of the different workshops that we've had. We've had over a thousand attendees from, di from many different towns throughout the state, as well as five different states. So we've done traditional extension work with municipal officials and other stakeholders, um, determining what the priorities are, developing programs and workshops and tools to try to move forward on these issues. But there's still a capacity gap between what towns need and want to do and what they have the resources to accomplish. So how can we better engage university students and at the same time build better partnerships with our local communities? So this is based on work that was done by Mark Boyer, um, published in 2017, where he looked at the different communities in Connecticut, dividing them into coastal, riverine, inland, and all communities. And he looked at which ones have climate action plans, vulnerability assessments, and natural hazard mitigation plans. And I just want to draw your attention to the coastal communities, where there are there's about 24 coastal communities. Um, and roughly half, a little bit more than half, have climate action plans and climate change vulnerability assessments. So the plans are there, but we need a new strategy in order to better meet the, the needs of our stakeholders and better prepare students for the future. And what municipal officials really need is that local information and then movement toward implementation of adaptation solutions. So we developed something called ADAPT-CT. Um, we've mor morphed into something new. And here you can see our website. This is the ADAPT-CT website where we have the Climate Adaptation Academy, as well as something new called the Climate Corps. So the Climate Corps was first funded through a three-year Yukon Provost Award. It's now funded through a five-year NSF grant for something called the Environment Corps, which I will describe shortly. The Yukon Climate Corps is a partnership between CLEAR, the Center for Land Use Education and Research, Connecticut Sea Grant, and Yukon Extension, and it involves environmental studies, environmental sciences, and environmental engineering. The Climate Corps itself is an academic one semester course, mainly for juniors and seniors. And in the course, um, we really focus on indicators, impacts, policy, vulnerability, and adaptation at the local level. It's easy to say what should be done, but students learn how local government makes decisions, how they work, and what are the roadblocks to moving forward. In the second semester, students can do an optional independent study in which they partner with municipalities or NGOs, such as land trusts, on either vulnerability assessments or actually doing some implementation of these um, vulnerability assessments or their plans. Students have a number of major assignments in the course but they have to attend a municipal meeting now virtually so that they can actually understand how the local government works. They do a role playing exercise in which some of them actually are municipal officials. And they also work on a cost of managed retreat or that's based on sea level rise so that they can actually understand how expensive some of these adaptation actions really are. So what is it that municipalities need to move forward on climate adaptation? Well, certainly they need that local level data, access to the data, recommendations for models, policies, design. They need to understand the costs and preferably how to phase in adaptation and of course money. So highlighted in the blue box are the things that students can assist municipalities and other partners with over the course of a semester. And here are um, the different projects that student teams have worked on. Uh, sometimes students choose to work alone, sometimes um, as part of a team. So they've done resilience management planning, um, vulnerability assessments, largely based on sea level rise for a number of counts. They've worked on the community rating system, different aspects of this. Students have put together outreach materials from municipalities, whether coastal or inland. Um, they've worked on storm water management, design of rain gardens. Beach management plans has been a, a really uh, popular one. They worked on sea level rise and brownfields and a number of other things. But these are things that either Bruce and I um, 
uh, put together with the communities and sometimes it's students come up with their own projects. So what works? Well, for certainly for students, um, they gain a better understanding of whether climate change is something they would like to work on, whether in the short term as a, or as a long term career. They get experience with applying the, the knowledge that they have gained both through this course and through their other university courses into actual problem solving, teamwork, and they have a resume builder. They actually have a product by the end of this. In terms of benefits for the community, it's positive action, steps taken toward climate adaptation. It's at no cost to them. It's great PR. We find that municipalities love working with students. And in terms of the university itself, we're building stronger ties, partnerships with our community and becoming a much more engaged university. So where can it go wrong? The logistics can be really hard. Students are on a really tight time frame in terms of semester schedule. And sometimes um, municipal officials are working on a very different time frame. And this is where Bruce and I come in um, as a go-between saying, you know, students really need that feedback within a week. They really can't wait three weeks. Um, snowstorms and weather delays can really delay trying to get out to look at sites. Um, working on a team can be difficult. And again, we, we try to work with the students to work through any issues that they have, but definitely a great skill to develop. We found that having GIS skills is a really important part. It is not um, something that they have to have. It's not a requirement for this course, but would be really helpful. Legal issues can come up. We're dealing with things that are hot button issues in communities. Um, and sometimes um, we've been asked to actually stop working on a particular project because it was such a hot button issue. And students have been great about just switching gears and working on something a little different. And Obviously, we want to be careful not to create conflicts with consultants, which has not been an issue at all. And actually, we've had consultants want to hire some of the students um, because they've been so impressed with the products that they've produced. So I mentioned that, that um, the climate core is part of something larger at the university. But again, it's building these partnerships with our towns here in Connecticut. We have a Brownfield core through engineering which again is based on the same model in terms of having an academic course and then more of an independent study, as well as a stormwater core. And so we're trying to integrate these three different programs together within the university under something called the Environment Core. So I'll leave you this, with this quote from a student, um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions later. Good afternoon. My name is Patricia Bowie. I'm a coastal resiliency specialist with the Massachusetts Office of Coastal Zone Management. And I'm excited to be here today to talk with you a little bit about CZM's Coastal Resilience Grant Program and highlight a few projects that we funded that emphasize um, key partnerships and collaborations across various sectors um, that help build public support for adaptation and advance long-term management strategies to reduce future impacts. To begin, I just wanted to um, provide a little bit of background on the grant program. Um, it was launched back in 2014 and is administered um, by CZM on behalf of our Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs. The grant program provides financial and technical assistance to coastal communities and nonprofits that own vulnerable coastal property that is open and accessible to the public. And the grant program is specifically designed um, to assist communities with efforts to reduce risks associated with flooding and erosion and sea level rise. We fund a, a range of resilience approaches, including detailed vulnerability and risk assessments, um, projects that increase awareness um, and understanding of, of coastal storms and climate change impacts, engineering and construction projects that redesign and retrofit vulnerable community facilities and infrastructure, um, proactive planning projects, as well as non-structural um, shoreline restoration projects, including beach and dune nourishment um, and coastal bank stabilization, among others. Since 2014, um, the state has awarded over $18.9 million in grant funding for 155 projects. Those projects um, are on the left-hand side of your screen. 
a lot of the dots are overlapping, so it doesn't look like that many, um, but a number of communities have received multiple awards over the years. Um, and since this is a discussion on partnerships, I think it's worth noting that this is a competitive grant program and that in the evaluation criteria, um, we do consider project management teams um, and the partners, um, and we look at their role in the project and their um, commitment to participate um, through the documented letters of support. So building consensus to adapt, um, this is really, um, you know, focused about um, demonstrating a need um, to adapt and the criticality for that. Massachusetts is a home rule state, meaning much of the authority to make land use decisions in, in the hands of the local governments. Um, and they're on the front lines of experiencing these impacts. So they're really in the best position to be evaluating their vulnerabilities. In Massachusetts, our executive office administers the Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Program. Um, this is really um, a great community-driven um, planning process that brings the community together to begin this discussion on the full range of climate phenomena affecting their area, um, discuss what their needs are, what they value, and um, work together to develop a list of priority action areas um, to advance for further evaluation. When a community does decide that they want to take a little bit more of a detailed look, um, whether at its specific area or infrastructure um, system in their community, um, we can provide funding um, support for that through the grant program. And one of the first things that we do um, with those risk assessment projects or any type of project is to establish a project management team. Um, so this is really, you know, looking at who um, will be involved in the project on a day-to-day or monthly basis. And from there, um, talk about who the other key players are that will eventually need to bring in to provide input on the project at key points along the way. So those players, um, it will depend on what the project is, um, what resource areas are being affected, and who has jurisdiction over what. Um, but typically, we work with representatives from um, federal, state, and local agencies, um, including DPW and engineering and conservation commissions and planning departments, um, regional planning associations, land trusts, and other nonprofits, um, contractors with planning and design expertise, academic and research institutions, um, local businesses, and of course, year-round um, and seasonal residents, visitors to the coast, students, volunteers. Um, part of CBM's role in um, providing technical assistance on the grant projects is um, to um, coordinate with these agencies um, at certain points so that they can be providing valuable input on the project, help you know flag some issues that the proponent will likely need to address before they file for um, a a permit. So having a good project management team and bringing in the partners um, so that they can provide input um, before they submit their permit um, really helps make the process a lot smoother. So building and maintaining um, that public support um, does take effort. You don't want to lose that momentum. Um, you know, I think a lot of people can agree that there's a sort of resurgence after a major storm that passes, um, but it's a lot more challenging to maintain um, the public involvement and interest um, in such forward-thinking projects when it is, you know, a nice and sunny day outside. A few things um, to help keep the public engaged um, would be using, um, you know, best available data to map and evaluate the current and future risks. You really want to be um, using um, models that um, take into account the dynamic nature of storms and sea level rise that helps um, to conform to local experience on the ground um, and understand um, what potential impacts might look like. Um, there also needs to be a thorough look at all um, potential options available to adapt. Um, you know, this gives the community 
a really good chance to think creatively about um, project alternatives, weigh the pros and cons, and eventually narrow down to a preferred alternative. Um, so that hopefully provides um, a lot of good backup documentation that you need to um, explain to people why this approach was chosen um, for such and such reasons. Um, throughout the continual public engagement process, um, communicating the benefits of adapting and the consequences of not adapting um, also helps build support to achieve long-term goals. Um, I think it's also valuable in recognizing that um, adaptation should be flexible. Um, it doesn't have, have to happen all at once. You can um, work toward changes um, incrementally. Um, and also, um, it might not as be as complex as you think to implement these projects if, you know, there are ways to incorporate um, measures into existing planning processes or capital improvement projects. I want to take a few minutes just to highlight um, a few projects that have demonstrated um, really good um, community outreach um, and engagement techniques. Um, in Marblehead, they are currently in the process of assessing the vulnerability of their harbor area. Um, and you can see the list of partners at the bottom um, of the screen. There's really a lot of involvement from various local boards and departments and, um, and businesses and nonprofits. Um, but what's really great about this project is the really robust um, outreach plan that they've developed. Um, they have uh, really strong um, workshops. The first one was in person, drew um, a crowd that was um, built out an entire auditorium. Um, and in this workshop, um, they were presented with the high resolution flood risk modeling, um, which looked at the flood risks um, um, based on probability. So they were able to really think about what the likelihood of something of a storm of the scenario of occurring as. Um, the terms were really explained in layman's terms. So I think that really helped to um, retain interest and involvement over the course of the project um, because it can be so easy to get lost in a lot of the scientific terminology and, um, and meaning behind everything. The next workshop, um, recapped that information, but then took a step further and laid out um, conceptual alternatives and planning pathways. So this is starting to take it a little bit further um, in discussing um, what some ways are for adapting could look like in Marblehead. And they weren't recommendations. It was more just food for thought, just trying to get um, the juice is flowing and um, thinking really creatively about adapting. Um, the public was also presented with um, ways that other communities have um, implemented measures and have um, started to think about how to plan for implementing these measures in the future. The last workshop hasn't been done yet, um, but it's on public-private partnerships. Um, and uh, this will discuss um, partnerships that will help enable um, coordination to reduce future vulnerability and improve resilience. Um, in Kingston, we funded a project at Gray's Beach. This is the town's only public beach, so it is a um, you know, widely used and well-loved recreational resource for the town. Um, there was a deteriorating stone revetment that was a public safety issue, and the town wanted to remove that, restore the area back to um, its salt marsh and dune habitat, and um, relocate a snack shack farther inland. Um, so they're really hitting a lot of great adaptation um, concepts and goals in this one project. Um, recently, we worked with the town to conduct seasonal and pre and post storm monitoring and maintenance. We learned a lot of lessons, um, you know, in regard to planting species and densities, um, core role anchoring techniques, um, as well as protocols for, for monitoring. Um, so now the town has that information um, in their back pocket. They can take it and run with it. Um, and um, I think they're feeling very confident in themselves in 
and doing the monitoring on their own. Um, one thing that was really great about this project was that they worked with local high school students to help with the plantings. Um, it took all day, um, but they were there to help and learn along the way. So it was a great collaborative project um, for the town and students. Um, and finally, for a regional example, um, this was a project pursued in conjunction with the towns of Provincetown, Furrow, Wellfleet, and East Ham. Um, and um, they wanted to um, pursue a more regional framework um, approach for shoreline management. The impetus for this project began back in 2017 when they, you know, recognized um, that the characteristics contributing to um, the resiliency of the shoreline um, to respond naturally to coastal hazards, um, though it, it, it operates independently of municipal boundaries. So the focus is really on getting rid of the municipal boundaries and thinking of this as one planning area. In this first phase, the community has developed um, a really robust um, geodatabase of existing baseline conditions, um, human uses, structural inventories, um, sediment transport pathways, and started to look at um, you know, how each community um, has their bylaws laid out, um, what the inconsistencies and consistencies are um, with that, and strengths and weaknesses, and so on. So the great thing about this project is that it did produce um, a signed intermunicipal memorandum of agreement um, between the four towns, um, which memorializes um, their commitment to continue working together um, toward the mutually beneficial regional shoreline management approach. While the towns have just um, begun this process, um, the regional partnership does aim to provide a lot of um, long-term benefits, um, including um, more effective responses taken in a coordinated, um, proactive way, improved cost efficiencies, and savings with common municipal goals, um, and being able to leverage greater funding resources. Um, I want to leave you with um, a list of links um, if you're interested in looking um, for more information on the grant program, um, as well as some other interesting um, resources, um, including the MyCoast platform, which provides reports entered by communities on um, storm damages and photos, and our climate change clearinghouse, which does provide downscaled climate change um, projections. So with that, um, I look forward to your questions and thank you for your time. Hi, I hear you're on your way up the New England coast coming from Massachusetts. Thanks so much for stopping by New Hampshire's small sliver of coastline. My name is Kirsten Howard. I'm the Coastal Resilience Coordinator for the New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services Coastal Program. And for the past seven years or so, our program has been providing technical assistance, expertise, and funding to our 17 coastal communities in New Hampshire, focused on sea level rise planning and other coastal hazard preparedness, with in particular an emphasis on empowering communities and protecting natural resources. I'm going to apologize in advance. This presentation is not the most hopeful or uplifting one I've ever given, um, but you're, you're watching from home and if it gets to be a little too much, you can just take a bathroom break and, or go walk your dog and I won't even know. Um, so we do a lot of things that programs like ours are supposed to do. We provide annual assistance to our regional planning commissions to advance resilience planning in our communities, most of which are small and have limited staff capacity to take on larger planning projects. We provide competitive resilience grant funding on an annual basis to our communities and partner organizations. We update the best available science that we use related to sea level rise and extreme precipitation and erosion and groundwater rise. And we work with partner organizations to get that science into state regulation. We pilot new habitat friendly techniques for infrastructure design and erosion management, like living shorelines and tidal crossing design. We compete for external funds to supplement our money through, through NIFWIF and through other NOAA class of money and FEMA. And we, we also show up in our communities when they express an interest and a need for our assistance. 
Um, but I'm not going to speak more broadly about all of that work today. Instead, I wanted to share a few really specific details and honest observations about how this work has played out in the community of Hampton, New Hampshire. And the take home point I'm trying to leave you with is that this work takes time, it takes money, and it takes long term commitment. One project is great, but not close to enough. And for me, that brings up really big questions about the capacity and the money needed to do this work well in all of the places that need it done, which is essentially every vulnerable community in the entire world as climate changes. Uh, so over a year ago, I met with Bonnie and Steve on their street. I was bringing some folks from NOAA to have a look at their community and uh, to meet um, them and hear about their high tide flooding issues. Bonnie has thought about moving but loves her neighborhood. She had her first summer job there. She and her neighbors have copies of each other's car keys so that they can move each other's vehicles if the high tide is coming up and they're unprepared for it. They're a tight knit and she just doesn't think she can find that on a different street. Steve invested his retirement money savings in some rental properties in the neighborhood. So he's uh, very financially invested in the street. Uh, when he showed up on his street, on the street to meet us, he had a rainbow pattern photo album with him. Uh, you know, the kind of album that is supposed to hold memories of your kids' birthday parties and family reunions. Well, he handed it to the NOAA officials who flipped through the memories of flooding, one flood after another. Some of them did major damage to his property. Others just limited road access for 15 minutes. Um, 50 times last year it happened. Steve said it was kind of fun to watch the first time, kind of exciting, but not anymore. And Steve told us that he has tried to sell his properties, but they won't sell. There were hundreds of dead crabs on his lawn when the tide receded in the most recent major storm, and, and people don't want to buy that, he concluded. So Hampton, New Hampshire, is New Hampshire's most vulnerable community when it comes to sea level rise and coastal flood risk. It has a year-round population of about 15,000 people, but population can triple in the summertime. Residents are 94% white. Uh, however, Hampton State Beach tourism is highly diverse. Many, many recreators come up um, from towns north of Boston to enjoy the public access and the entertainment provided at the beach and along the strip in Hampton. It's a town that is at its core a uh, barrier beach um, and fishing town, but with significant upland area actually where many of the full-time residents live. The town has um, 471 acres of developed land in the 1% annual chance floodplain, and a few neighborhoods experience regular high tide flooding up their streets and into their yards. The town accounts for the town of Hampton actually accounts for 20% of the state of New Hampshire's FEMA flood insurance claims cumulatively since the year 1986. That's just over $6 million as of October 2018. And with four feet of sea level rise, which is possible by 2100 and likely by 2150, the majority of the Barrier Beach neighborhoods will be flooded twice daily, including major roadways. So I laid out this timeline to help you visualize how resilience work has progressed in Hampton over time. It doesn't include everything, but it includes some of the biggest things. Uh, work to assess vulnerability to sea level rise and to encourage adaptation action in Hampton started around 2012 with sea level rise vulnerability assessment work. And it's kind of, it kind of chugged along slowly until 2018 when two major nor'easters hit. When my program noted the neighborhood mobilization from Steve and Bonnie and their other neighbors as a result of the storm impacts. We saw an opportunity to capitalize with some staff support and funding. And you can see from the timeline how action really took off in 2018. We partnered with a local conservation organization, the Seacoast, uh, the Seabrook Hampton Estuary Alliance, SHEA, uh, to run three information workshops for residents, the Flood Smart Seacoast workshop series. 
they were incredibly well attended. And the 2019 March town meeting in Hampton saw a boon of significant flood related ordinances, including a new ordinance to allow free parking at high elevation lots uh, during 10 foot plus high tides. We also applied and received grants with Hampton. Uh, we worked with partners to conduct uh, a situation assessment um, and survey residents on their thoughts about sea level rise planning and even managed retreat. And as momentum built, we made a case to our program leaders for an annual technical assistance funding grant of $12,000, not much, um, to our local partner, to Shea. The town allocated dedicated money for a hydrodynamic flood model and recommendations on conceptual designs for action. Uh, we started a new town-based group called the Coastal Hazard Adaptation Team, a chat made of volunteer board members and residents, and that continues to meet monthly. We allocated NOAA funds for Hampton's master plan updates to the vision and the creation of a new coastal hazards section in that plan. We partnered with the DPW to use their warrant article funds to match a National Coastal Resilience Fund grant from NIFWF. Um, and as the storms faded from memory, uh, as other issues took their place in priority, like COVID or, or what it, whatever it might have been, the, the momentum from the storm, the momentum from the storm faded. Um, but I really do think our presence and our persistence helped to maintain forward, forward momentum rather than stagnation. New champions and local experts have been created in Hampton. Trust has been built among state and local government and residents. The work has been rewarding overall and sustained and consistent and passionate and local, although I think it can always be more local. At the same time, resident frustration is mounting about how long it takes to do a flood study, about the lack of concrete visible action taken on the ground, and I look back at the fact that the knowledge of sea level rise vulnerability has been on the town's radar for at least eight years with dedicated and intense action over the past three years, four years. We've done a lot, but we've also done very little in the grand scheme of what needs to be done. And I think about the action, uh, or I think about the fact that it takes a full couple of months of my time to apply for a National Coastal Resilience Fund grant for $180,000 if I can find the match to apply at all. And it makes me wonder a bit about how high we are going to be able to reach um, on the y-axis of this chart that I made up um, on that, that measure of resilience. So pulling away from Hampton, now to think about the bigger picture of our programming and to tee up some discussion, New Hampshire's dedicated coastal resilience grant program is funded entirely with NOAA money that we choose to pass through our state coastal zone management program. And since 2014, we've allocated $850,000 across 17 towns. We've worked with partners to do some really awesome projects with this money, but they're pennies compared to what is really needed to address the problem. So on top of the need for more money from many sources, I think the Hampton example helps illustrate that empowering people, building trust, and finding decision-making windows of opportunity doesn't necessarily happen faster with more money. Fundamentally, I think we need to be honest with ourselves and with each other about, about how little time we have to mitigate the harm that sea level rise is going, going to cause for our low-lying communities around the world and, and come up with transformational models for engagement and action. Uh, with that, I look forward to talking about the appropriate next steps to take during our discussion. And thanks for stopping by our small seacoast on your Northeast tour. Now I'll let you continue on your road trip up to Maine. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Slavensky. I'm a marine geologist with the Maine Geological Survey in the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. We're part of a networked Maine coastal program and provide technical assistance to the coastal program, other state agencies, and municipalities. Today, I'm going to be the last speaker, and I'm going to be sharing with you some transferable climate resiliency case studies from Maine. Just to orient you, uh, Maine has 142 coastal municipalities and about 5,400 miles of tidally influenced coastline, a lot more than our uh, neighbors to the south of New England. Um, and uh, we've engaged about 70 municipalities 
uh, on a range of climate resiliency issues over about the last decade. So we're about halfway there. So the model we've used for engagement is typically we receive funding. Our coastal program receives funding from the Coastal Zone Management Act from NOAA, Section 309. And from that, we dole out a variety of funds uh, to support different programs. We also provide planning assistance, and our office provides scientific and technical support to municipalities and regional planning organizations. When we're engaging with a municipality, we'll typically bring in a regional planning organization or a non-governmental organization for assistance as needed. We'll use grant funding to hire private consultants or engineers uh, if they have expertise that we need. But really, what we're trying to do is we're focusing on municipal, locally driven, yet transferable, transferable adaptation strategies, which we can then take and provide to other municipalities who are working on similar issues. Now, there's been challenges, of course, in, 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 in doing this kind of work. Um, this is what I call our uh, equation challenge. Uh, so we're a strongly home rule state. We don't have um, a strong regional or uh, county level of government. So there's the state and then there's the local level, which pretty much implements all the rules and regulations. Um, in general, in the past, we've had a lack of financial and political support for, to support climate resiliency issues. That's changing with our new administration. We also have a lack of capacity at the local, regional, and at the state level in terms of personnel and expertise. And there are only some communities or regions that are actually interested in working on climate resiliency. And as a result of this, we end up with what I call a patchwork approach to resiliency. So many times we focus on what's called low hanging fruit. So being able to develop transferable methodologies or models for our municipalities is key for them to be able to tackle these issues. So I'm going to spend the rest of my time talking about are some transferable state and local case studies. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some products that we at the state level have, have put together for developing model language for integrated climate resiliency. Touch on um, some work that we did in Penobscot Bay, Maine, looking at a model for assessing resiliency uh, adaptation of working waterfront infrastructure. And finally, finishing talking about um, a model for a low cost living shoreline for stabilizing, stabilizing coastal bluffs. So again, one of the things we wanted to do at the state level, because we had so many municipalities coming to us and asking for models or guidance, we wanted to create a climate adaptation guidance series. And working with our municipal planning and assistance program and a range of other stakeholders, we developed a municipal climate adaptation guidance series, which provides transferable models for integrating climate change language into a variety of existing planning documents. So you didn't have to go and reinvent the wheel and create your own climate action plan, for instance. But using this, we were able to develop model language for everything from transportation plans to comprehensive plans to subdivision ordinances that integrate climate change into those existing planning products which communities already have to work with. The next thing we did is realizing that we can't be everywhere at the same time trying to provide technical support to municipalities was create what we call the main flood resilience checklist and this was done uh, through a NOAA fellowship program a two-year fellowship program and what it does is it provides a transferable model for municipal engagement it's implemented by partners that have been trained either a regional planning organization or a non-governmental organization and it, it involves direct facilitated engagement with municipalities that results in actionable lists of adaptation activities that are tailored to a community. So even though the process is a model that's followed, the outcomes are tailored to each community. And so far about 10% of our coastal communities have, have finished this checklist. I wanted to touch base with you about a project that we completed last year, a NOAA funded project in conjunction with the Island Institute and some consultants that we hired on working waterfronts in Penobscot Bay. We had 10 working waterfront sites um, that we looked at and what we wanted to do was develop a vulnerability assessment and resilience planning model that could be adapted uh, very easily by other communities. So we looked at um, 10, commun 10 different communities and 10 different working waterfronts. And what I'm going to share with you are just some highlights from one of the sites, Public Landing, Breakwater, and Belfast. So this methodology involved actually getting on the ground and visiting with local officials, looking at certain structures, doing a site-specific survey, looking at structural deficiencies and also topography, flood modeling, vulnerability assessments, and resilience planning. So this is the site in public landing in Belfast. There is a wharf, um, a parking area, breakwater, boat ramp, and park and walkway. And the area, of course, that we focused on was this working waterfront area. 
The first step was actually doing site visits and looking at structural deficiencies for superstructure, substructure connections on these sites. And one of the keys was developing a good, easy to use report. And municipalities love photos. So identifying these deficiencies using photos and documenting what those deficiencies were key for actually making structural improvements. The next step was actually looking at sea level rise planning. Uh, we looked at short, mid, and long term using a higher end of the intermediate scenario from NOAA and integrated that into our model. And the way we did that is we used the 1% uh, FEMA floodplains and then re ran, working with our consultants, re ran those models to look at one, two, and four feet of sea level rise and then looked at how resilient the infrastructure is to those specific changes uh, in floodplain elevations. A result of that is a table which really identifies site elevations and risks. And uh, this table looks at uh, certain facilities, uh, so a wharf or pier or different docks on those piers, and present day water levels from mean high or high water all the way up to a, a 1% uh, base flood elevation, uh, and then a short, mid, and long term scenario um, using those sea level rise scenarios I talked about. And the, the numbers you see here um, highlighted indicate flood elevations above the elevation of the structure that we're trying to look at. This is a little bit confusing to read, so what we did is we actually simplified that into what I think is one of the key, key take-home charts from this, which was water levels versus key infrastructure elevations graph. So in this example, there's a wharf elevation drawn along the graph, and we look at, can look at mean high water, highest annual tide, 1% still water, and 1% base flood elevations, and which of those levels actually um, exceed the wharf elevation in your present, short, mid, and long-term conditions. And this resonated very well with our communities. The next step, of course, was to, do, to prepare a detailed um, recommendation on adaptation and cost estimates associated with those um, for present day and short and long term conditions. And the final step was community outreach. And we uh, conducted workshops, in person workshops with participating communities, actually did some online workshops as well, and really focused also on how to fund some of the adaptation strategies, which we've identified. Uh, and then uh, continual work is post workshop follow up um, on implementing the improvements. The last thing I'd like to share with you is um, a transferable, low-cost living shoreline approach for bluff stabilization. This is for, uh, with a NOAA-funded project that involves all five New England states. But in Maine, uh, we had a, a lot of project partners as seen right down in here. What we wanted to do was um, build demonstration living shoreline treatments that are transferable to other areas. So our project location is in southwestern Maine on Lanes Island in the town of Yarmouth in Casco Bay. Casco Bay is in the southwestern portion of Maine. Uh, Lanes Island is in Yarmouth, which is just off the coast of Freeport and Yarmouth and the Royal River. And our site is actually um, on the south end of Lanes Island. This is a photo of our site. It's about a 10 to 12 foot eroding bluff, a coastal bluff. About 48% of Maine's coastline is coastal bluff, and about one third of that is actually eroding. And what we're seeing is a lot of shoreline stabilization where something like this is regraded and riprapped from above the high tide to the top of slope. And therefore, you don't have any more transfer of sediment from the upland to the wetland. So how are we supposed to maintain um, the resources we're trying to protect in the face of climate change if we're cutting off the supply of sediment? So this project, again, was to try to develop a transferable method, low cost, that beneficially reuses naturally occurring materials, in this case, trees. We had a lot of downed trees at the site. This is what the site looks like from a close-up aerial. Um, you can see the downed trees. This is a, the, the, the design that we came up with, which is what I call a stepped crib approach. Um, this is a, a view of that stepped crib. It's one, two, three steps. Uh, the bluff is regraded. Uh, material is placed into this. Tree, tree root rods are placed on the sides and also uh, within the first step. And then vertical and horizontal tree runners are used uh, in the slope stabilization plan. So this is kind of the existing Cross section, you can see the steep slope, about 12 foot bluff. And again, this is the proposed section where it's regraded, root rods are placed in, vertical and horizontal runners are put, and then that is all regraded, planted, and excess material is placed in the toe of the first installation. And this is the uh, this is kind of what the project site looks like before construction. You can see all the down trees. Uh, you can't really see the steep slope here. But in this image right here, uh, during construction, the regrading has occurred and you can see that the slope has been cut back and vertical tree runners have been put in uh, and then horizontal members have been put in. This is kind of what that looks like in the next step. And then in the final slide right here, uh, this is nearing completion where planting is actually being put in. This work was done by Sumco, a contractor that we use for this, an environmental contractor. Uh, and again, the idea here is to develop a transferable model 
the homeowner, when they see this, will say, well, we kind of like the way that looks. It beneficially reuses naturally occurring materials, and it creates a more resilient shoreline. It'll still maintain that connection between the upland and the wetland. If this first tier fails, sediment from that will go, and then you'll still have protection in the second and third tiers. So with that, that's all I had uh, to share with you today. Um, I look forward to your questions and any discussion afterwards. Thank you very much. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back. Um, I think we got briefly cut off there at the very end of Pete Slavinsky's presentation. Um, but I want to thank all of the speakers for those excellent presentations. Um, we have about 14 minutes or so for um, questions from the audience. So uh, I'd like to remind you that there's uh, a question an answer panel inside the uh, go to webinar control panel and we are starting to get some of those questions rolling in so i am going to fire away here um we actually have a question that was just submitted to uh the entire group um and so maybe we'll start uh if each of you could just comment on this in in uh you know 30 seconds or so how do you each define long-term for sea level rise adaptation? And what advice do you have on preparing for these more extreme scenarios? For example, the tw year 2100 projection. Um, maybe Juliana, could we, could we start with you since uh, you were the first up? Sure. So Juliana Barrett from Connecticut. Um, so currently uh, Connecticut is looking at sea level rise projection projections out to 2050 because beyond that the uncertainty just gets too great um, in order to base regional planning efforts town planning efforts um, so that that limits us right in terms of how far out we're going to look um, and then can you repeat the second part of the question uh, do you have any advice on preparing for some of these more extreme scenarios I, I think a lot of it's what you heard today. It's it's engaging with the communities. It's saying, you know, this is a real issue. Let's try to work together. It's not going to be, there's no easy answers. So I'll, I'll stop there and let other people go. Pete August, any thoughts? Um, our immediate term are dealing with nuisance tide flooding issues. Those are happening right now and they're driving people crazy. Our longish term is 2050 2060 three to five foot sea level rise uh, scenarios um 2100 seems way too far off into the future for people to get their arms around but our real big headache that we we don't know what to do with is the 100 year storm that is inevitable there's just no preparing for that and that's going to be catastrophic for some of our low-lying areas mm -hmm. And uh, in, in Maine, one of the things we're doing, I guess, is uh, and this we kind of borrowed this concept from New Hampshire is um, and some other uh, states and municipalities. But we're we're using language that basically states that we want to commit to prepare for something and commit to manage to something else. Uh, when we talk shorter term, um, we're talking about a slightly lower scenario with more certainty. Uh, and for a longer term, we're, we're jumping that up to a higher scenario, but that's the kind of the commit to prepare for concept, while the commit to manage concept is, you know, a, 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 a smaller number um, in the 2050 range, you know, somewhere around two feet with potentially four feet by 2100. But the commit to prepare for um, jumps that basically to double those numbers. Thanks, Pete. One, Any thoughts? Yeah, sure. Uh, one thing, New Hampshire, New Hampshire recently released uh, coastal flood risk guidance, um, which is an update to their their previous version of guidance. And what they they went up to 2150 with projections in that uh, guidance document. However, given the issue Juliana brought up um, that the uncertainty gets major once you get out past out to 2100, 
um, the approach we took this time around was to uh, enable users of the guidance to determine their own tolerance for flood risk based on whatever they're planning around. So that includes um, thinking about the useful life of a facility like a wastewater treatment facility, which obviously is probably going to exist beyond 2050 at this point if you're doing major upgrades to it or building a new one. So they would plan for 2100 with a maybe a low tolerance for flood risk and use higher sea level rise numbers as a result just to accommodate that uncertainty. So that I'd encourage you to take a look at that New Hampshire Coastal Flood Risk Guidance if you're looking for more uh, information about that approach. And then one additional thing I'd say about the uncertainty longer term and bigger sea level rise projections that I've seen other places uh, sort of talk about using is the idea of trigger points. So uh, sort of the concept that that Pete was bringing up that you know, if we see a certain amount by this point in time, we've predetermined that we're going to take this adaptation strategy. But if it if it turns out to be lower than that, we're able to accommodate, you know, a certain amount and sort of thinking about that in advance. I'll just add in, um, I agree with all of the other panelists. Um, in Massachusetts, we see communities typically utilize 2030, 2050, and 2070 sea level rise projections. Um, and most are using the intermediate to high to high scenarios for that. Um, and I think a lot of the need is looking, you know, pretty short term for right now, but um, understanding how that risk um, increases and is exacerbated with um, higher storm surge and greater tides. So I agree with Kirsten, it kind of depends on what infrastructure um, and assets um, are in question, um, what the building materials are and the criticality of it is. So that'll determine how far out into the future you're looking at. Excellent, thanks to you all. Um, we have another question here that's actually for all presenters. Uh, how much has collaboration in your state's coastal zone management program influenced the success or non-success of the programs detailed today? Do you wish to describe successful or innovative approaches to collaboration across your state's CZM program? Um, I'm not sure you all need to address this, and in fact, some of you are with CZM programs, <laughs> but uh, do any of those who um, aren't working uh, with CZM want to want to touch on that? Pete, maybe? Pete August? Yeah, yeah so um, much of everything that we do is driven by our Rhode Island CRMC, either guidance or data products. Our coastal program has been fantastic in creating vulnerability analytical tools, and they're the basis of everything that we do. They also have a number of grant programs that um, we have been successful in getting small grants to do small management activities to enhance coastal resilience. And so I would say the Rhode Island CRMC is a central key focal player for us. I don't know how we would get by without them. That's great to hear. Any other comments on that one? Uh, I mean, I, I would just say that, uh, you know, we're a network program, so we work all the time with our municipalities and our regional planning organizations. And I don't think that we'd be able to do any of the work without the collaboration that we have um, already you know, established through a variety of different projects, um, some related to coastal resiliency, some not. Uh, so there's just a long history of working together on a variety of different issues that carries over into this topic. Thanks. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that are related to buyouts. Uh, and again, this is for this is for anybody that would like to answer. Uh, buyouts or retreats seem to be the most bold or transformative approach to addressing sea level rise for the most vulnerable communities. Have the New England states been successful in getting buy-in from citizens, towns, and governments to seriously consider buyout programs? I, I can start with that one. Um, yes. Um, in Connecticut, uh, in the town of West Haven, there's an area that was repeatedly flooded um, and with uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service uh, floodplain management funding, um, there was a buyout program. Um, it's still a very, very difficult topic. Um, and actually we're, we're working on a managed retreat workshop um, that's gonna be online just to get the, the conversation going. 
Uh, I'll, I'll go next. Um, up in Maine, uh, we don't really have a, a buyout program per se, but I would say that managed retreat has been implemented uh, because some communities just couldn't afford to maintain the losses that they were sustaining uh, as it related to, you know, like a roadway or um, endings of gas lines or water lines uh, that were just getting washed out constantly. So it was kind of being forced upon them um, just by just by that. But we do in our regulations have language which says, you know, if if a, if a structure is inundated over a certain amount of time, um, then it actually actually be removed. So we don't have a buyout program per se, but that there is language that kind of pushes you towards a retreat aspect. Mm -hmm. Kirsten, I'll, I'll just add one kind of specific anecdote related to Hampton because um, they have we've been sort of exploring options with the town. And I'm sure this happens elsewhere too, um, along the spectrum of, of, of strategies, right? From protecting again, keeping the water out to moving out of the water's way, which is sort of your retreat option. And so um, I found that couching it in, in the suite of options alongside the idea of a seawall has been really helpful in bringing the conversation up with folks who maybe are a little bit uncomfortable with it. Um, and then th the challenge that small towns like that are facing when it comes to actually implementing a program that I've seen anyway is that, you know, Hampton has, the town has to find their staff resources to actually apply, figure out how to choose, choose residents and then apply on behalf of them to the state to actually apply for if they're going for FEMA buyout money. And that whole, even just that concept is beyond the capacity of a 15,000 person town unless they're faced with like a huge storm, for example. Um, and so I think proactive kind of managed retreat is a long way out and a huge barrier for small towns like, like Hampton. One of the things that I think needs to be implemented in advance of managed retreat and maybe lower hanging fruit is the idea of not redeveloping in those unsafe areas, which we're still seeing super, uh, massive redevelopment condos and whatnot in very vulnerable places. And in Massachusetts, um, a couple of communities on the Cape have been, um, and islands have been successful at um, retreat and have been able to move some infrastructure um, off of beaches and dunes to a more landward and elevated location. So we're really um, encouraging of those types of projects um, to come in for the grant program. Um, but it does take a lot of public outreach and engagement to get the butters on board um, and communicating the benefits of that work to restore the area back to a more natural system. Great. Um, there's actually more questions about buyouts, but I want to keep moving because we only have a few minutes. Uh, so there are a few questions about local politics. One is directly for Kirsten. Hampton seems to be in a very vulnerable condition. Uh, would the community have had better solutions if they acted sooner? And what are some solutions that are coming out of your efforts for this town? I think that's probably true everywhere, but I think getting folks to act sooner is the challenge, right? Um, because their priority lists are so long um, given given the staff capacity they have. So how you how you crack that nut, I think, is a big, a big question for me. Um, the solutions that they've, or strategies that they're entertaining range from um, following, uh, kind of taking uh, hydrodynamic flood modeling that, that was done uh, specifically focused on a couple of the most vulnerable neighborhoods there. Um, they're thinking about everything from seawalls at this point to um, to improved drainage systems, to home elevations, to buyouts. Um, and so they're really at the phase where they're looking at all those things at the same time and thinking about, you know, the permitting implications or perhaps prohibitions on, say, a new seawall um, and, and how that might stand in the way of these neighborhoods that really want that option. Um, and, then, and then sort of evaluating the alternatives as a result of, of those sort of um, challenges they're facing. So very interesting kind of set of conversations. Um, I think they kind of have to go through it all to, to get to a point where, where the community is ready to make some choices. Well, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm being given the uh, please wrap it up warning. So uh, I'd like to remind everybody, all the attendees that you can, we didn't get to all the questions. And if you have questions for these panelists that you'd like to message them directly, you can use um, the, the connect with them through Pathable. 
Um, but I'd like to just thank you all again. It's good to see you all. Uh, I think this was an excellent session and um, thanks everybody for joining us. Take care. Thank you. Thank you everyone.